Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, we play Spot the Difference between a Taurosaurus and a Triceratops, plus Jay Foreman on the ultimate dinosaur pet. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Terrible Lizards. And we're going to get all spiky today and all neck shieldy and all stampy. Yes. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good clue to what's got coming up. Um, I could have said horny, but I think that would have been inappropriate because we're going to be talking about not Triceratops, but another Ceratopsian. And don't worry, it's not one of the little boring ones. <laughs> yes, we skipped on from Cetacosaurus and we're now on to Taurosaurus. Ooh, Toro, 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 Taurosaurus. So, okay, Taurosaurus in my head, like, it's it's the one, it's got two big horns, isn't it? Isn't that, yeah, so, is that the one I'm thinking so of? So when you, when you said it's not Triceratops, that ultimately is what the crux of this episode is going to be about, which is kind of Boom. why I wanted to talk about it. So picture Triceratops in your head. Oh, yeah. That's more or less Taurosaurus. They lived at the same time. They lived in the same place. We have found Taurosaurus and Triceratops in the same fossil beds. So very late Cretaceous, very, very late, end late Cretaceous. Um, right there when the meteor struck. Probably, yeah. Though, as well, Taurosaurus is pretty rare, so we don't have as many of them. And Triceratops is actually around for quite a while. Um, so it's perfectly possible that it was there, but I don't think we've, I don't think we've got any Taurosaurus that are right up at that boundary yet. Um, but definitely close to that time. North America, so southern Canada through to, I think there's one in Mexico, uh, western side of the North American continent. So broadly similar to Triceratops in distribution, basically the same as Triceratops in age, very similar in size. But it's not a tri, it's only got two prongs. No, it has got a I nose thought. horn, it's just not very has big. It? Yeah. It's got a stunted it's nose got, horn. It's got a little nose horn. Um, and the, the thing that really makes it different, which of course is true of a lot of ceratopsians, is the frill. And if you remember back all the way to series one, I want to say episode two, we did Triceratops. No, that, I think that was, di- that was Diplodocus. We def- it was definitely one of the first few. Um, yeah. Triceratops is weird in that it has a solid frill, and no other Ceratopsian has this. And Taurosaurus doesn't have this. Taurosaurus has a big pair of holes in the frill, exactly like you'd expect in every other Ceratopsian. Um, and the frill is pretty long. There's been all kinds of arguments about just how long it is. And there's a couple of probably rather dodgy reconstructions that show it just going on and on and on and on this is kind of giant oval that never finishes uh one time it was regarded as having like the largest skull in history uh it doesn't because there are whales with bigger skulls but then that became the largest land animal in history and maybe certainly but there's there's a couple of things out there as like it has a three meter long skull and a that includes the frill which is already cheating a little bit and b that's an upper estimate of what's probably a bit exaggerated so if it's got is that why it's got the holes then to reduce the amount of weight or is there another reason for well that? that that's always been an argument for the fenestra which is the proper anatomical term for those in in the frill in general is that yeah it's a weight reduction device because it's this giant sheet of bone and as we've discussed if it was supposed to be armor obviously brackets except triceratops because triceratops is clearly doing something weird but if it's supposed to be armor you don't really want holes in it the idea that frills in general were some kind of defensive mechanism and it's like you know medieval knights did not you know that armor was heavy they did not cut big holes in it to save weight because of the obvious problem of cutting a big hole in your armor not quite so defensively anymore once you've done that but wouldn't it if you if they were in the right place and you pierced them and then you'd have locked your enemy together next to you a bit like antlers locked well you'd probably just well. rip a hole all in some relatively thin skin. I mean, it would have been pretty thick and tough skin, actually, but of course, compared to a sheep bone, not a lot. Uh, Taurosaurus's frill is also pretty thin compared to Triceratops, or at least okay. thinner. Um, and that really is the main difference between them. So the Taurosaurus has got a smaller nose horn, longer frill with bigger holes in it. And if you also remember, there's, there's little spikes around the edge. And Taurosaurus also has a different number of spikes around the edge that Triceratops does. Okay. There's other subtlety de- subtleties as well, but th- those are the big ones. And then this is where we get into the meat of this. So back in, oh, I want to say 2009, 2010 kind of time, 
there was a paper came out by uh, John Scanella and Jack Horner basically arguing that Taurosaurus is basically just a big old Triceratops. And when Triceratops got old enough, they would look like Taurosaurus. And I think it is fair to say that hasn't gone down great with a large number of paleontologists, and I would include myself among them. It is also one of those ideas that, like, stuck instantly. And again, there is, you know, we've talked about this with scientific papers. There is a technical scientific paper that was peer reviewed and yada, yada, yada. It's a serious hypothesis that should be considered. But you think it's wrong. (laughs) Well, no, but it's it's, but it's more that I I think we have talked about this before. But I I think people think that, like, whatever is the most recent paper is right. And that's not really how science works. We talked about that with the Spinosaurus paper. Um, and well, because the most recent one is your paper. Yeah, so it's definitely That's so it's definitely, definitely right, right, and everything else is wrong. <laughs> but but that but you get that from people, and so I see time and again it's like, oh, Taurosaur, you know, Taurosaurus is really Triceratops. No one's disproved it, and that was the last time anyone said anything about it. And it's like, well, they never proved it in the first place. A, B, several people have written papers disputing key parts of that hypothesis. So you're wrong on that front as well. And C, you don't necessarily have to write a paper to prove something's wrong for that idea to be discredited or fall out of favour. There was a paper 10-12 years ago that came out um, about um, the physics of other planets and Earth-like planets and literally in the last line of the paper like it was literally a planetary physicist went, and of course evolution could potentially proceed the same way in these other planets and maybe there are dinosaurs. And he's just like I'm sorry, did you just conclude there are dinosaurs on other planets in, in other parts of the universe universe on the grounds of how you think evolution works oh boy you should not be writing that i think it's fair to say that no one ever has written a specific rebuttal paper to suggest that that's wrong oh so it's true and no one thinks it's right yeah right but no (laughs) one thinks this is true you don't have to respond to a paper for it to be wrong and rejected by the scientific community (laughs) okay if the universe is infinite dave if it is actually infinite there are dinosaurs and other planets mathematically (laughs) yes i think think you'll find that's not quite what they mean <laughs> or we could get a sparrow and ping it into space <laughs> just a really really big catapult <laughs> unlucky sparrow <laughs> dinosaurs in space well, or lucky first first in spa- you know yeah well still you could put has, a sparrow been... in sparrow in a rocket with a billionaire there you go but has there been one because i mean we all, we all know about the you know the dogs the and chimpanzees and, that yeah. went up but but various you know they've taken ants and goldfish and and some other and they, there were geckos was it wasn't that one the russians took some geckos up and they got out and were running around the space station <laughs> ha, 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 you'd think someone would have taken a bird by now I know has somebody... there been a space dinosaur i i, I know somebody smoked on the um in the and space station once so the <laughs> oh space station God. yeah they had a cigarette and <laughs> the smell is still there slightly because you can't get rid of it get rid of it yeah i bet it is God. Yeah, but there we go. Don't don't smoke, kids, particularly on the space station. <laughs> on the ISS, which is which is crumbling as it is. <laughs> oh, a nice well. pre- anyway, <laughs> anyway, off, so off the subject of space dinosaurs, so, back tri- to Taurosaurus. Tri- triceratops, Taurosaurus. Yeah. So, so what, tell this... me about no, well, before you before, explain to me. You think yeah, okay. They think it is turning into this. Dino. Is there any biological reason why one species would suddenly change into another? For example, I happen to know that like grasshoppers turn into locusts, or if you get a domestic pig and put it in the wild, it beefs up, it gets wiry, it grows tusks. All of these things happen in other species. Why is it so unreasonable that it wouldn't a Triceratops couldn't turn into a Taurosaurus? So, it, well, that's the interesting thing. So, it's not unreasonable as a fundamental concept, as you say. There's lots of things like that. I mean, if you want to take an extreme example, tadpoles turn into frogs and caterpillars turn into butterflies. You know. Animals often change dramatically as they grow. That's not an entirely weird thing. We've talked already about protoceratops and my work on that, showing that frill changes shape quite dramatically as it grows. That's totally a thing. Can I can I do a side thing and ask really quickly? Um, yes. Is well, I where's this guy? I, no, I do, no, see, no, I don't trust that. I don't trust that expression. I know. Well, no, I know the listeners dinosaurs. can't see it. <laughs> it's not dinosaurs, but it is zoology. So yes. I heard that there's a theory going around that cats caterpillars or and it's kind of been 
debunked, but it's not really, that caterpillars and butterflies are separate species originally. Yeah, so there's a classic example of someone publishing something absolutely insane and basically getting away with <laughs> but it. I no, this is a. It. Why can't that, we that... have. Velociraptors yeah. on Mars. And yeah, the, 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 the guy, the guy who argued that. So there's a guy who basically said that yeah, what, caterpillars were worms, and then they basically combined with other animals, and that's how you get butterflies. Um, and yeah, but the thing is, he got it into a really high end journal because he was an editor on that journal, and at the time, the journal had a policy that editors could publish their own papers without review. That was literally the paper which stopped that policy. Curiously enough. Um, this, I want to say it's the same guy. I, I'm pretty sure it is, but if it's not him, it's someone who definitely buys that hypothesis, has a website up where he has his list of everything that's turned into everything else. And it's like stegosaurs turned into pangolins and ankylosaurs turned into armadillos and... Oh, it gets weirder from there. Um, yeah. Well, no, is the short answer. <laughs> okay. It's that okay. whole field. I just, I just wanted, I just wanted, because it's one of those things that you sort of hear about on the internet and you think, oh, that's, that's a really lovely way of thinking about things and that'll make Dave twitch. So I thought I'd, uh, I'd reintroduce that to yeah. the conversation. Yeah. So why? No. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, why do animals do that, though? Why do things like domestic pigs change shape and grasshoppers change shape? Well, the, well the, the, the pigs, it's a, it's probably a weird one because of domestication and, and how that works. But there is this long and short of it, though, of course, I'm far from geneticists, is the idea of epigenetics and the fact that, you know, environment can influence how you develop. Um, and a great example of this, there's, well, I can't remember what kind it is. There's some kind of bullfrog that has these tadpoles. And basically, depending on the amount of food that is available, the tadpoles will grow differently. And I can't remember, I can't remember which around it is, but it doesn't really matter. Like if there's lots of food around, they grow to one kind of shape and they tend to eat algae. And if there's no food around, they tend to go a different kind of shape and become carnivorous and start eating each other. So you you can take the same group of tadpoles, you can take the same group of eggs from one set of parents and just split them into different ponds and the tadpoles will develop totally differently according to the local environment. Jekyll and Hyde frogs. Um, And so you basically have these environmental controlled genetics. That's not the same thing with what we're talking about here. We're arguably talking about, again, the same kind of stuff I've talked about with protoceratops and sociosexual signals when we talked about dinosaur behavior. The fact that if you're a baby sheep, horns are largely irrelevant. What you need to do is eat and grow and get big enough that maybe one day you can be a ram. And once you are, that's when you need horns and you stop growing yourself and start growing your horns and you suddenly change. Do you think that's why lambs are so cute to try and stop us eating? Because they're so cute. Well, it's not working well, is it? No, it's not. It's <laughs> if that's not. the strategy, it, they need to rethink. I think, I, think, I think it changed Lisa Simpson into a vegetarian, a lamb. So it did yes. work in that case. But so. One. <laughs> one, still. Yeah. But, but, sh- but sheep, still tasty, tasty, they tasty, are. tasty lamb. Yum, yum, yum. Uh, so there are various reasons that things will dramatically change shape as they grow. That's a perfectly reasonable hypothesis. Indeed, Scanella and Horner and others have also suggested um, that with Pachycephalosaurus, so the big dome-headed dinosaurs, which remember are actually really quite closely related. The ones that live in the the ones that live in the caves and don't want to hit their heads, so they've got really thick skulls. So that's what they've got that's what they got their motorcycle helmet. So they proposed <laughs> a fundamentally similar hypothesis about a series of um, Pachycephalosaur fossils that actually is largely supported and agree with. And I would sit on that side as well. So it's not the concept of the hypothesis that people have a problem with, which some, again, you've seen some commenters on the internet going, oh, no one likes Horner, no one believes Horner after his scavenger. It's like, no, lots of people, including me, are happy with the idea that some of our previously separate dinosaur species are probably one and they grow from one to the other to the other. It's the evidence for this particular case of Triceratops and Taurosaurus that they have a problem with because they've looked at the presented evidence and think that it isn't very good. And that's what I wanted to talk about, because as I say, 10, 12 years later, 
still see it every few months going, oh, Triceratops is really Taurosaurus, and oh, di- people don't understand dinosaur taxonomy, and oh, the paleontologists need to rename all their dinosaurs because of this one hypothesis from this one page. It's like, no, that's not what it is. That's not true. So obviously I'm going to do that in our podcast, and the people who already know this because they already listen to this and would agree with me anyway are not particularly going to be convinced, but it's interesting to talk about, so here we are. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like it's, you get those things of people like, oh, if you could have put one thought into everyone's head around the world for one minute, what would you do? And it's like, this would probably be high on the list. It's like, <laughs> can not... we get rid of Nano Tyrannus and Taurosaurus and can we stop talking about no, paleontologists no, 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 don't no, understand taxonomy? Because we do. You want to get rid of Nano Tyrannus and say that they're just young Tyrannosaurs. Uh, sorry, Taurosaurus. Tyrannosaurus. Rexes. Yeah. Uh, and then you want to say, actually, Taurosaurus is its own separate species. It is not. Uh, <laughs> yes. So yeah, I mean, we we talked about the the the, the taxon, you know, the procedure of good taxonomy. So one of the things that just come out from this, which is again, no one ever said is Triceratops doesn't exist anymore. It's like, well, it it does because the rules of names is the first one is kept, and Triceratops was named before Taurosaurus. If they are the same thing, which they're not, but if they are the same thing, we'd be calling them all Triceratops, not Taurosaurus. It's not just because it's the adult that name wins so triceratops exists regardless of whether or not you accept this hypothesis but anyway so Scanella and horner's paper what did they say well they basically pointed out that the two things tend to live in the same place in the same time and the analysis of various bones show that triceratops tend to be immature at some level and that taurosaurus tended to be older in, in terms of their development at some level, they basically had older bones. So the the, the, the samples that, that you, you found of Triceratops were of younger animals than of Taurosaurus? Yeah. Okay. So like there's no baby Taurosauruses going around anywhere. There's no... And oh, of, oh, uh, we, oh, we will. Let, let's, let's, let's stop. <laughs> It's, you, get you're jumping away. ahead. You're jumping ahead. I'm Let's sorry. Cut, you, know. you say these things and I have good, to good, question you. Yeah, I know. Good good scientific writing. We'll lay out all the basics and then we'll go through them. Okay. So they live in the same time at the same place. Taurosaurus skeletons seem to be older as individuals than Triceratops. And how do you account for the holes in the frill? The idea being, so they looked at some Triceratops frill and showed that bone in the areas that would go on to become, they argue would therefore go on to become those fenestrae in the Taurosaurus, were showing evidence of rapid change and remodeling and getting thinner. Um, And that was kind of fundamentally the argument. Uh, and then they also kind of said, well, this this was, you know, a, a fairly rapid change, which is why we haven't really found any intermediates. What were they saying? That their little nose bone had just worn away or fallen off? Well, the, but the, the, this is part of the transition and as part of those changes, the, the, the nose horn goes or at least reduces. Um, and again, there are some things that, you know, pretty much everything that they that I've just said is, is largely true in the sense that they, they do live in the same time and same place. The, a lot of the Triceratops need to be juveniles. A lot of the Taurosaurus seem to be adults. Inverted, and I'm saying using really inverted commas for juveniles. There are, you know, seven, eight meter Triceratops that weigh four or five tons. But again, we've talked about this before when we talked about growth in dinosaurs. You know, they don't grow like mammals. It's perfectly possible to have very, very large animals indeed that under one category you would call a juvenile. Uh, Matt Weddle, who I think we mentioned before, is a great sauropod expert. And he wrote this great piece on a paper I did on growth. Matt was one of the co-authors. I said, look, there are some, you know, Matt's seen some sauropod species which are bigger than Diplodocus and he's never seen an animal which you would call an adult by a standard dinosaur definition they just don't well they just don't seem to kind of quite finish growing properly they just get more and more grown up yeah but in in a way so they're still retaining some of those juvenile features in the way that the bones fuse and these these patterns of growth but they're clearly full size and they're having sex and having babies and we find eggs and and if you look for medullary bone remember that signature of egg laying you find it so they're sexually mature and and having babies they, they just sort of retain some of these weird teenagery features so when i'm saying well, inverted commas, and well, yeah spiky hair they yeah. dyed blonde yeah so when we Cheap. so when i say juvenile triceratops there are some really quite small baby triceratops you know skulls that are 30 40 centimeters long but i'm saying even these really big things are not necessarily fully fused up fully finished growing or at that slowest growth phase 
animals. So, so not the slow scrap. Because I was going to say they're a bit like crocodiles, because crocodiles never stop growing, but they do reach adult. Yeah, quite. So, so they would still be, they would be on that growth trajectory of slowing down. But at this point, usually we talked about this. You know, various bits of the bones fuse together. They just haven't mm. quite done that. They, they they you get often get a change in texture on the bones. That texture change hasn't quite kicked in. You know, it's mm. getting there, but not quite there. So as I say, so so all the things they said about these are are basically true. The question is, is that strong enough evidence to say that these two things are truly distinct? Sorry are truly the same and it's convincing case that one turns into the other and there are inevitably some fairly big problems with this which is why a lot of people aren't very convinced by it um i'm getting first... huge clark kent superman vibes at the moment <laughs> well the frill would make quite a good cape actually in it torosaurus at least if, if, yeah. if you get it rippling in the breeze with the right color on it do triceratops um, wear glasses that is well, they've kind of got those almost like little rings of bone around them, so they're not a million miles yeah. off. But, right, there, there's, there's a drawing for the next next round of drawings. <laughs> we want Clark Kent, Triceratops, and Superman, Taurosaurus. He just pushed his quiff back and made it a longer frill. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so, you know, how convincing is this? Well, the, the obvious big question is, well, where are the intermediates? If you really have got, we've got hundreds of specimens of Triceratops. Now, not hundreds of skeletons, not hundreds of skulls, but certainly hundreds of bits and certainly dozens of skulls. If they're turning from one thing into the other, shouldn't you find one where the frill holes are just opening? Mm. Remember I said they had different numbers of spikes around the margin? Shouldn't you find some with an intermediate? number or and 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 at least in a couple of them they shift from being an even number to an odd number so you have to kind of like realign them as well which implies like almost all of them might be changing that sounds uncomfortable if they were actually doing it. yeah it's it would be a very weird it's so it, it you expect to find these like intermediates the, the counter argument was maybe that growth change happens very very quickly mm. that is possible that would explain why we can't find them if torosaurus were these true adults big adults tend to be rare we've talked about that before that would kind of line up um but you've got some problems like you know well why would they transition so quickly if you went from no frill and no spikes to frill and spikes that makes sense in a sexual selection sexual selection context and remember we know triceratops are fighting because we've got these injury traces from them that shows that their horns line up where they get injuries they're actively fighting with their horns if actively fighting with your horns is a big thing that you do all the time suddenly changing that why why are, are the torosaurus not fighting maybe that it's would like, be an odd thing for them to do maybe they're like the wise elders of the triceratops <laughs> and they've matured past it and maybe that's how they got the holes it's too much fighting and then yeah they, it, it their holes got worn down yeah but, <laughs> but as you can see you, you know you're struggling to explain why why you do that how, how is there an optimal fighting head size and shape for Triceratops and a completely different one for the rarer Taurosaurus. Remember, Triceratops, we know they're breeding. We have medullary bone for them. So are they then not fighting with Taurosaurus? It, it's all, it doesn't fit with how we understand sexually selected and sociosexual signals to grow. It just doesn't. It also doesn't fit with what we see in other Ceratopsians. Remember, we've got like embryos for Protoceratops and you can see the frill openings. It's not like Protoceratops has a nice solid frill and then later on it opens up open frills are universal for um ceratopsians so while it's kind of odd that triceratops doesn't have it it also it's also arguably even odder that triceratops somehow gets rid of it as a baby and then regains it as an adult it's something else that no ceratopsian does well we do that we cover ourselves in fur as embryos and then you know non furry as children and then furry again right but that's a near universal thing that you see like across mammals because it's this ancient ancestral trait we don't see this in all other ceratopsians okay. um the other another part of the problem you've got is i said that you know they they almost perfectly line up in when and where you find them but 
not brilliantly. Okay, Taurosaurus is rare, so the fact that we find places where there are Triceratops and no Taurosaurus is pretty reasonable. If they are these big old rare adults, you're not always going to find them even if Triceratops is quite common. A bigger problem, though, is that there are places, and indeed times, where we find Taurosaurus and we don't find Triceratops. Ah, which If Taurosaurus is the big old weird one and it's rare, shouldn't you find 10, 20, 50, 100 Triceratops for every Taurosaurus you turn up? Oh, people's Rather than naught. It's an old people's home. That's what it is. Well, They've moved on. The elders have gone to their magic coven of uh, Taurosaurus life that is... I agree. It seems it seems an utterly bizarre thing. I mean, but they are found in groups because we had this thing with Triceratops that there's good evidence that they were solitary animals, and even so though the, there are, you so know, you tend to find them on their own. There, there is one alleged adult. I say alleged. I think it's pretty certain is an adult group found together, but it just hasn't been described yet. As I say, I don't think that's a big secret anymore. Um, but well, obviously, it isn't now. To... Well, <laughs> you, yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> No, I think it's an idea. It's definitely out there. But yeah, there, there's a couple of juvenile groups. So all the other than this one, I think one, all the adults are, are basically individuals, despite there being loads and loads and loads of them. Um, but as I say, you know, finding Taurus, Taurosaurus in places where we don't find Triceratops isn't a great argument. There's a couple of Taurosaurus which look, or their bone texture, fusion, etc., 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 are rather more juvenile. And again, juvenile in big quotes more sub-adult like and a lot like what you see in a lot of triceratops there's a taurosaurus doing the rounds at the moment so it's on display i can't remember what museum it's in there was a ton of photos came out of this thing a couple of months ago uh, and now by the time this comes out three, three four, four months, months ago, ago um and and it's a it's a fairly complete in really nice shape taurosaurus and its nickname in the lab is tiny and i've and it's not an ironic tiny it really isn't very big at all for a taurosaurus or indeed for a triceratops um and this no one's described i mean there's photos of it online the museum has put photos up that, uh, again i'm absolutely not giving away any big secrets but certainly mark one eyeball me looking at those photos going yeah that's smaller than most other triceratops i've seen if this is only a big old adult animal that one sure ain't that could have been a really tiny triceratops though it could have been a, a mini well it could it could but it's it's you know you you go back to the you know christopher hitchens extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence if you have to go well maybe it's because of that for every single line of evidence you it's clearly not a particularly strong argument it's occam's razor i think is the yes so it's, it's the simplest explanation yeah so yeah it, this trajectory this growth trajectory isn't what we see in other ceratopsians there's no reason to think it would occur like that that's not what we see for sexually selected traits they don't particularly well overlap in time and space, or at least in the sense that there are times and places that Taurosaurus appears and Triceratops doesn't. Um, the frill spikes is not a very convincing one at all because they'd have to shuffle in all kinds of weird ways. Why does um, their nose fall off? Why does the nose horn get smaller? That's yeah, because again, we see variations. So those those spikes around the edge, we see variations in those numbers. But we've never seen one in Triceratops with the same number and pattern as Taurosaurus, and surely that would turn up. The horns in Triceratops change as they grow. There are different horn shapes between different species of Triceratops. But I don't think anyone's ever seen the nose horn just kind of vanish for any apparent reason. And again, if it's useful in Triceratops, why would Taurosaurus get rid of it? You'd think they're doing at least some things pretty similarly if they are literally the same species. What I find really interesting about the frill and the holes and everything else is it seems obvious therefore if Triceratops is using their frill for shields I mean literally for protection we've got evidence they're using for t- protection isn't it more obvious that Taurosaurus is using it as sexual display or signalling or something but that's the thing. so a, the, remember these things can always be multifunctional uh, elephants signal with their tusks and they fight with their tusks they you you don't have to be and they one or the them. other well but the, the obvious thing you think of is if okay let's Triceratops Triceratops is fighting with its horns and using its frill for a, a shield. And I'm not entirely sure it is using its frill for a shield because these these Triceratops and Triceratops injuries are kind of at the base, not in the middle or at the, at the back. But let's go with that for now. 
if this is all about sex and competition and and winning, and you've now got Triceratops with bigger horns, or at least a bigger nose horn, and armor, and Taurosaurus without, if they have a fight, who's going to win? Triceratops. The one with the the one who's still got the spikes and the armor. So how on earth is Taurosaurus ever going to win a fight? <laughs> <laughs> it can f- it can use its head nodding to fan away because uh, it's got such yeah. a bigger thrill. It could just like you know just whisk it out the door. There you go. Yeah. So <laughs> en- en- enter the final piece of this awkward triumvirate jigsaw, which is Nidoceratops. Nidoceratops. So we have a th- so we have a third animal, and this is a weird one. So Nidoceratops was a- was originally named uh, um, Diceratops for two horns. Uh, because its nose is mostly missing. So a classic piece of um, taxonomy, they went, oh, it's like Triceratops, it's only got two horns, we'll call it Diceratops. It's like, it's got, it's got no nose. How do you know it's only got two horns? Um, but there was, I want to say it was a beetle, but it could be a fly that already had the name Diceratops, and you can't have two things with the same name. So eventually it got renamed as Nidoceratops. So is, so Scanella and Horner suggested that Nidoceratops is something like the in intermediate. It's got some features of Triceratops and some features of Taurosaurus. Most notably it's kind of got some weird holes in the frill, even though it's very Triceratops-like. Um... The first problem with this is it does have holes in the frill, but they're really irregular. They're not in the obvious place that you'd see one each side in exactly the right point. Uh, and they're supposed to be at least partially pathological because it's got some kind of disease or injury going on. It's right. got one hole like all the way down the side, which like nothing else ever has. It does have a couple of holes in the main bit of the frill, but they're not in the same bit of the frill that Triceratops's frill is thinning in and Taurus Taurosaurus's holes are in. So if this is an intermediate, its holes are in completely the wrong place. Um, if you do a kind of shape analysis of the whole shape of the skull, you actually find that different sizes of Triceratops and of the f- we have a narrower range, but different sizes of Taurosaurus don't overlap with each other, and nor does Nidoceratops sit between them. You're just ruining this. You're ruining this for everyone. Yeah, so it's not a very convincing intermediate. And it's also not very convincing that Triceratops turns into Taurosaurus. And Andy Farkey, who I'm sure I've mentioned before, has wrote this great redescription of Nidoceratops and looked at it and concluded that it is its own genus and species. And yes, it's got things in common with Triceratops and Taurosaurus, but that's not a big surprise. It's a pretty close relative that lived in the same time and same place. You'd expect it. It's, it's like, well, we did this analysis of lions and tigers and leopards, and it turned out they're very similar to each other. <laughs> well, well, they would be. They're all big cats living in... <laughs> Africa and India. Well, tigers don't live in Africa, but this really shouldn't be a big surprise. Uh, so, you know, the long and short of all of that really is that ultimately, yeah, the idea that Taurosaurus is some big, weird, old Triceratops is really not very well supported. Um, and, you know, the arguments for it were never particularly convincing, and people have actually assessed these in some rigour at various times, these skull shape and analyses, looking at these distributions of characters and shape and time and space and growth. And it's just not very strong. And I don't think many people agree with it. Right. I'm just having a look. At the time. Um, or... No, no, no. Oh. At what animals have been to space? Okay. Oh. Ten animals that have been to space, according to Discover Wildlife. You've got dogs, monkeys and apes, mice. Well, that monkeys and apes, so that's two different things at least already. Well, exactly. Well, fruit flies. Yeah, well, that's not a surprise. I said dogs. Tortoises. Have they? Didn't know that. In 1968, the Russians launched Zond 5 spaceship with a capsule carrying samples of soil and seeds, some worms and two step tortoises. <laughs> See, that's, you know, I, I, I know the Cold War was a, was a really odd time in terms of competition, but as second place goes, we put a man on the moon. Ah, we put a tortoise into orbit. Two tortoises. It doesn't do. Two tortoises. It, it doesn't have quite the 
chain ring to it. Frogs, they've been to amphibians, been up there. Spiders, they've been up. Fish. Oh, I'm not surprised by that. Obviously tardigrades, because otherwise... We, we, we want to colonise the moon with something. What else would you send? And then finally, uh, nematodes. Yeah, so, that's not a surprise. No uh, birds. Uh, roundworms have been up there, but no dinosaurs. This is... this. I mean, somebody needs to take... Give Bezos a call. <laughs> you want, you want, usually, like, you know, pirates would have parrots and minor birds and things like that, simply because they're very efficient in terms of food. They can eat cereals. They're quite well kept. They only poo and wee out the same thing. They're good. You'd think they'd be perfect for space. Just on principle. I know. You'd think someone would have taken a sparrow. Or, you know, or, or a chicken. Something that couldn't, you a know, chicken. kiwi. Kiwi would have great fun. L- l- let yourself go, mate, as high as you want. It could fly. <laughs> could say, I mean, an ostrich would do damage. Yeah, so it's a so small flightless bird. But be very <laughs> good at operating the controls, I feel. <laughs> Um, Very enthusiastic. Anyway, so the last thing to to kind of go, get this vaguely back on track. Oh yeah. Um, so much as with the kind of nano tyrannus argument, and I want to deal with nano tyrannus more thoroughly at some point. That that would be even more longer and torturous, and going over all the same points again. You know, w- what would be like the definitive resolution of this? And there are, of course, a couple. Like if we found a really true intermediate, if you turn up with the triceratops skull with those holes just opening up and all. All the little spiky bits around the edge melting or expanding or breaking and turning and the nose horn half gone. We'd have to have another look at that and go, ooh, might be right. Alternatively, if we can find a truly adult triceratops that is, you know, definitively adult in every possible way of its growth and frill fusion and all the rest of it, and it hasn't turned into anything else, that would pretty much kill that idea, as would, of course, a juvenile Taurosaurus. I mean, as I said, there's this thing, tiny, tiny is not very big at all, but it's still good size triceratops size. I mean, like a real, you know, dining table size baby with a head that's only 50 centimeters long, you know, comparable to the smallest triceratops that we've got i mean that would be fatal instantly to this hypothesis you can't possibly have them operating at that size or even a taurosaurus nest would probably help yeah well an embryo or anything like like that yeah um that that would obviously obviously do it it. or 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 even any you know any just small enough skull with the with the fenestrae in it Mm. and a small nose horn would would really be problematic um so it's not a done deal but other than a few people who are involved in the original study and some of their students I think it's fair to say there are very few people who really think that this is a strong argument or even the right answer. But there are gaps to fill in, um, and there's some fairly obvious ways, as I say, that could prove or disprove it. And I personally suspect, okay, I know nothing about the research, I know no one who's working on it, I've seen a handful of photos, but Tiny might well be that specimen. Um, so it could be that this is a matter of time before we get a pretty solid answer um, yeah. to the end of this. I think you're Lois Lane and you're completely... Bef- bewildered by it you're just trying to convince yourself that you couldn't possibly love clark kent but secretly do so uh (laughs) i never thought anyone would accuse me of that in this podcast (laughs) you're secretly in love with clark kent this seems unlikely i'm saying well you already love superman is the point and then you can't admit that your nerdy office boy is actually superman because he wears glasses and slicks his hair back so, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, um, are you convinced? Do let us know. We have now for you. <laughs> no, though. please don't. We don't care. <laughs> don't tell us. We <laughs> get enough tell emails Dave. as it is. Tell, tell Dave. <laughs> It'll be great. Uh, and you can do that because at the end of the series, as you know, episode eight is the questions episode and we are coming up to that. So please do, if you have a question for Dave, write in now if you're very angry about this episode. And I think you've every right to be. But before... <laughs> We, uh, you've got goodbye. such we've a grin got, on your face. You're so happy with what we've here. got. We've got a magnificent guest, which is the uh, wonderful comedian and uh, brilliant uh, musician of everything. It is the magnificent Jay Foreman. Jay, thank you so much for coming on Terrible Lizards. It is absolutely wonderful to see you again and looking well and nice bedroom in the background. Uh, what What is your relationship with dinosaurs? Because I know, like, we are already away. You've done a song about dinosaurs. But are you a fan of dinosaurs? Well, I'm in the rather shameful position. I think I'm like most people in the world where when I was a kid, I was enthralled by dinosaurs and I had a a big 3D book of dinosaurs that you had to put on these red green glasses to see the dinosaurs leaping out at you. And I loved it. And then like most people after the age of about 12, I sort of I started forgetting about dinosaurs. And I don't know why that happens to most people, but um, I'm on the wrong podcast to admit that it happened to me. (laughs) 
It didn't happen to Dave. Or if it did, he's in the wrong job. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. But we, We've had this discussion before, but it's like I was never that obsessed by them because I was obsessed by all animals equally, and I just kind of drifted into paleontology rather by accident. So, Jay, um, bear in mind that, you know, this is your one and only chance to ask a real paleontologist an actual question about dinosaurs. Uh, do you have a question you'd like to ask Dave? Well, is it okay if I ask two questions? Because Possibly. I was trying to think of one, I thought of two really good ones, and one of them breaks down into two parts. Most, be- most people do. The first question I've got is, what is the world's biggest dinosaur mistake? And what I mean by that is either what is the most commonly held belief about dinosaurs that has now turned out to be wrong, or, if it's a more exciting answer, what is the thing that was once thought about dinosaurs that has turned out to be the most massively embarrassingly wrong? As a lot. Wow, that is a cool question. I, th- I think that for the first one, it- it's slightly not quite dinosaurs, but there's this kind of pervasive view that almost anything extinct, particularly if it's a reptile, then it's a dinosaur. And you can kind of forgive people for, for pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, and various marine reptiles that lived alongside dinosaurs and should be in those scenes and were doing things with them. Okay, you can see why people aren't necessarily bang on with the exact scientific definitions and stuff. But I've seen things like mammoths and ammonites and trilobites and saber-toothed cats described as dinosaurs. That's annoying. Yeah, that's... <laughs> you know, you know, it's like pulling a snail out of the garden going, human! <laughs> it's like, no, these are so ludicrously far away. <laughs> Just because it's extinct does not mean it's a dinosaur. That's not how it works. And my thing is that dinosaurs survived the KT extinction. So 65 million years ago, a big rock hit the earth and all the dinosaurs died. No, they didn't. Otherwise, we wouldn't have birds now. Birds are dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are birds. Hey, name a species of dinosaur. Tyrannosaurus rex. Yes. Robin. Yes. Dinosaurs. <laughs> Same thing. Yes. That, that is the other big one, but we've covered that God knows how many times. I know, but it still <laughs> it upsets me that even when I tell people this in the pub, they look at me like I'm an idiot and I'm not the idiot this time. This time. Yeah, I, I, I remember, oh God, probably about 10 years ago, the BBC did a little, you know, like the CBBS quiz for dinosaurs. And I and all my colleagues got nine out of 10 because one of those questions was, are dinosaurs still alive? And of course the answer is, yes, yes we all got it wrong. <laughs> So all the paleontologists <laughs> didn't get full marks on the quiz aimed at eight-year-olds. It's annoying. What was the other part of the question then? Hang on, hang on. What was the second bit? Well, I was thinking more along the lines of the things that experts get wrong. So the thing that comes to mind for me is uh, in Crystal Palace Park, they've got these wonderful, huge models of what they thought mm. dinosaurs were like in the Victorian times. And interestingly, even though it's all proven that they've put the uh, hands and feet and claws in the wrong place, they're not allowed to change them and update them because they're grade one listed structures. So I wonder what sort of things that, you know, proper experts, paleontologists doing dinosaur podcasts 100 years ago, what have they turned out to be wrong about? The bird thing. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's, that's, a, that's a big one, actually. So, yeah, I mean, the bir- birds were originally dismissed as being dinosaurs. There was a big thing for a long time about what are birds and where have they actually come from? And there was this huge gap and no one could fill it. And a couple of people, most notably Thomas Henry Huxley, suggested it was birds and everyone went, ooh, but there's this one problem, um, which is basically the wishbone and they were completely wrong about that one problem and they should have they should have ignored the fact that they were completely wrong they should have noticed that they were completely wrong about this and we would have solved bird origins you know 100 years ago even 150 years ago if people had thought about it more correctly i mean the crystal palace stuff is a great example in the sense that yeah they're obviously hilariously wrong in hindsight but those were designed at a time when we had a handful of bones i mean you have to have quite big hands to hold up those bones well that's <laughs> That's <laughs> okay, that's a fair point. But yeah, we, we didn't have tons of skeletons. We didn't have complete specimens to work from. No one really suspected the depths of the detail that we'd be able to get out of them. Remember, this was pretty early days for anatomy and biology and the other natural sciences as well. So I, it would be easy to point to them and go, yeah, they're obviously rubbish and they should have known better. Some things they definitely could have done better at the time, but they're, they're not that bad, all things considered. That's the impression I get from those models is because they're made in such a sort of hilarious cartoony 
sort of almost smiley way that they must have known at the time. Look, this is about as accurate as we're going to get, but it's not supposed to be accurate. It's just a fun experiment of, hey, these are the things that we think might have lived millions of years ago. Aren't they funny? Yeah, and and some of them are some of them are very good and have really stood the test of time. Though inevitably, the things that we had more complete skeletons of, so like the marine ichthyosaurs, there's fossil giant deer there as well. We know what deer look like. It's hard to get that <laughs> too wrong. But there's there's things like uh, I think there's a temnospondyl. So this is a pre-dinosaur. This is an ancient giant amphibian, which is really kind of flat. So think of almost like almost like a crocodile, a big long animal, three four meters long, big head that's flat and really quite wide. Um, and yeah, they they've basically done it as this giant fat toad because I think someone went, oh, amphibian. We know what they look like. <laughs> Just did it as a frog. Either they it's thought like... it was an amphibian, or they had in mind the kids playing in Crystal Palace Park, and they thought, well, this will be easier to climb on. Yeah, <laughs> quite quite possibly. I, I heard just the other day from a colleague of mine who's done some research into into those models. Actually, that there's there's a giant sloth model, so the same animal you see at the Natural History Museum if you've been there, um, standing up to a tree trunk. Uh, and apparently part of the reason that's in shoddy condition is at one point there was a bit of a children's zoo there and for the goat enclosure they just put a fence around the giant sloth and the goats just climbed up and down and all over this damn thing <laughs> which as you say is now a grade one listed building but used to be a goat climbing frame which <laughs> shows you perhaps a changing attitude towards our heritage in recent years I, 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 well, the best thing about that is where they put the iguanodon thumb the iguanodon thumb claw ends up on the iguanodon's nose on the nose see so, so, See, I wrote about that just the other day for for my next book, and I think in, I think that's very reasonable. For a start, they didn't actually have any hands. Uh, secondly, no one suspected that animals had spikes in their fists at that point. And thirdly, Gideon Mantell, who was largely responsible for that, was referencing iguanas, and of course there are rhinoceros iguanas, which literally have a spike at their end of their nose. It's Iguanodon. He literally thought it was a giant iguana. That's where the spike would go on a giant iguana. So it's nothing like as silly as it sounds you, you'll see people go well of course he didn't know better we didn't have the whole skeleton and he just stuck it on the nose referencing a giant rhino it's like no he was referencing rhino iguanas specifically he wasn't stupid enough to go oh well I'll make it look like a rhino because it's a big mammal or a big herbivore the amazing twist would be if it turns out in 200 years time that the Victorians were more accurate than we are now and they really were smiling all the time <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess, you, you know, we, we get things that come and go. Like I said, the idea that birds or dinosaurs came up, went again very quickly, vanished for a long period of time and now resurrected. And that's that. This is the problem when you've got limited data. I think people have this idea of paleontology in particular and science in general as these kind of shifting sands and, oh, well, they told you that last week and now they tell you that this week. Well, with paleo in particular, you know, we've got like 10% of the data most of the time, if we're lucky. And therefore, it doesn't necessarily take very much to tip it over one side of the seesaw or the other and then it also doesn't take much to tip it back the other way um so yeah we we end up changing our opinion based on the available evidence but how quickly does it change for example if they tried making jurassic park now how different would it look what's the biggest mistake in that film other than suggesting it's possible but that arguably is the depressing thing about the recent ones because you know when they first announced the new jurassic world and there was lots of people kind of going well cool can we see updated dinosaurs it's been 30 years let's have the latest scientific evidence and then they came out and they were pretty awful and the the kind of defense of the filmmakers which i would totally get was they went like yeah but we're trying it's set in the same world it's set in the same universe we're we're showing you the same animals because it's those same animals that those people are experiencing which would be fine were it not for the fact that they've basically changed them in every single film and sometimes quite dramatically and often they've made them actively worse i mean the stegosaurus is the classic example there's a there's stegosaurus shown in the lost world so the, the second one of the original trilogy and it's a fantastic model of a stegosaurus if you could use it tomorrow I'd be delighted with it and instead the ones you see in the most recent film it looks like something from King Kong from the 30s its tail is dragging on the ground its plates are in the wrong places its back shape is wrong its leg length is wrong and it's like so these aren't the same animals at all are they you've actively turned them into something that's 70 years out of date great well if you're going to do that why don't you make them right <laughs> It's quite, it's quite frustrating, and it, and it's the little things as well that is of that really upset paleontologists. Things like all the Velociraptor hands do this, and they that is a, an animal with broken wrists. They would have gone that this, way. This doesn't work on a podcast. Yeah, does I know, it? but I'm in, I'm entertaining Jay. Look, I'm doing the floppy hand thing. As as an example, so I, I literally saw Aquaman last night. Did you get his autograph? <laughs> no, unfortunately, I I literally only just saw the movie Aquaman last night, um, and that's got 
a couple of little shots of prehistoric world with dinosaurs and pterosaurs in it. And they're genuinely better than the ones in Jurassic World. These throwaway shots in the background just to go, yeah, there's dinosaurs here in Aquaman are better than the dinosaur centric movies. I guess the makers of Jurassic Park, they're not necessarily thinking of what's the most accurate dinosaur we could do, but they're trying to tell a, a story about scary dinosaurs. And if they if they have the option to choose between big, scary scales or cute, fluffy feathers, they'll go with the scales. Scales versus feathers being the first example that comes to mind, even though I'm sure that's wrong. Yeah, no, it, it is for it is for a lot of them. Uh, they would have, Velociraptor in particular would have looked just like a big chicken. I mean, a, you know, a fully feathered large bird. With um, wings. And as I say, I, I right, but as I say, I, I agree if that's what they were doing, but they, they keep kind of changing their own justification and then don't live up to their own explanations. One of the producers or even the director said something like, oh, well, our explanation is that they, they can't put feathers on these animals because they don't have the genes and they haven't been able to do it. And then there's that shot in the first one where they see the experimental lab of all the animals that haven't been released yet and there's a lizard with feathers on it. It's like, so you can do it then. It's in your film. <laughs> I saw it. It's not much of an excuse. <laughs> I wonder if it's because feathers are harder to animate. It's not that they're not... Made, well, it's partly because it's... It, well, it was back in 1993. It would have been harder to make feathers look good. It was back then, but not now. But I guess also you can't really make a, a befeathered animal look as threatening. And if that's a whole part of the film... Well, the, the usual answer is, have you ever been attacked by a chicken, let alone a cassowary? <laughs> yeah. It's pretty intimidating when they get going. I was a student in York, which was apparently the only campus in the world where students are outnumbered by geese. So uh, we got used <laughs> to it there, and they are vicious. Yeah, quite. If, if they're Canada geese, there's that lovely joke I've seen in the last couple of years that the reason the Canadians are so nice is every time a Canadian is born, all their anger and hatred is transferred to a goose. And that's why <laughs> Canadians are lovely and Canada geese are evil. Just because I don't know the answer to this question, it's just popped in my head. Oh, do Canada geese migrate to Canada? Or is that... No, no they're, they're invasives, basically. Okay. They're, they're like grey squirrels. They've been brought over, so we're stuck with them. But they are were originally they Canadian. Them. Oh, yeah. In, in Canada, there's, there's tons of them. They're absolutely everywhere. As, as they are are here in fact well it's, it's this whole thing we used to think barnacle geese As barnacle geese turned into barnacles or something ridiculous so that was their eggs we used to think because the barnacle geese used to go away and nest and everything else we never saw them nest but they used to go away and then just before they came back again was the time we got a lot of storms and all the barnacles would wash up on the beaches and so people thought that the barnacle geese came from barnacles hence barnacle geese which and I thought that yeah. might be a bit like Canada but apparently Canada that's where they're from I, d- I don't think so <laughs> Well, there's that story that the same thing with storks, you know, storks would be around absolutely ever and then would vanish. And we knew that there were storks in Africa. But what we didn't know is were the storks in Africa the storks we had in Europe? Uh, and that was always a, a question. And apparently this was resolved in something like 1870 or 1890. Please tell me this involves a paint gun. <laughs> no, a stork turned up in Germany with a Maasai spear stuck through it, <laughs> which kind of suggested that it had flown over from Africa. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, Jay had another question because we're massively off topic. <laughs> yeah. Well, my other question is a lot more basic, and I assume that someone has asked you before, but just in case they haven't, which dinosaur makes the best pet? No, I don't think we've had that. No. Oh, really? We, we, we had Alistair Beckett King asked which would be the best one to ride, which is clearly <laughs> a related question at some level, but definitely different. As a friend of mine, John Conway did a little poster of dinosaurs as pets as just the kind of thing you'd see in a vet's office. Nice. If you went there and they're like, you know, you know, here's your rabbit, guinea pig, hamster, dog, cat thing, and he did one of dinosaurs. Um, the first problem, of course, is most of them are quite large, and you probably don't want something that weighs several tons. Although we have dogs and cats, a lot of the small carnivores are potentially pretty vicious. Again, as anyone who's kept chickens or parrots would know, an unhappy parrot is not an animal you want to have to wrangle with regularly. You know, one of the little herbivores, and ideally something that's going to be relatively free of sharp bits um, if you're, it's your first attempt at taming it I'd probably pick something like Aquilops so Aquilops name means eagle face and it's a very early Ceratopsian so it doesn't sound it doesn't sound very friendly to wake up to in the morning an eagle face yeah I know it's um so it's a Ceratopsian so it's part of the same group of Triceratops and all of its relatives but a very early animal so first of all really tiny couple of feet long 
long. Secondly, none of the big frills and horns and spikes on it. It's got a little bump on his nose and that's about it. Um, and would mostly run around on his back legs. So he's kind of bipedal. Still has the beak at the front, but it is purely herbivorous. So it'd be great for munching through all kinds of household rubbish food items. So you could <laughs> give it almost anything vegetarian and it would probably be quite happy with that. How much do we know about how big its appetite was? Not too much. Aqualops is known only from a single skull. Um, so we don't have a ton of it, unfortunately, though the head that we do have is really, really nice. They mostly have this very grinding dentition for relatively tough stuff. So they'd probably like a lot of woody stems and things like that. But again, that's really common Alpen. for... Alpen. Probably feed it Alpen. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's the kind of thing. Yeah, I'm sure at that size, they'd be happy with nuts and berries and fruit. They'd, stuff like that is usually very important for small herbivores. But imagine the farts, Dave. I mean... Necessarily... Well, for a start, they're not very big. I mean, they'd be they'd be better than your average dog i think for that yeah, that's point true. of view that is true and also um it's good to sort of remind everybody now how more um metabolically um efficient a lot of herbivorous dinosaurs were although because it's a small one it, this might not yeah, be it's, as it's the big ones that are super efficient so they, these are probably still inverted commas warm-blooded mm. um so they're pretty active they're not they're not going to be your usual reptile and just sleep all day but their diet's going to be more iguana like than anything else so pretty easy could you try train it to poo in a corner or something i'd be surprised if you couldn't i mean most <laughs> most animals i mean if you if this is this is something that comes up we're getting off 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 topic but you know the intelligence of animals and how smart are they obviously we don't really know that and you can't really work it out and also some were more stupid than others within the species definitely but it's, it's also partly just a, an issue of, of training you know sheep are not particularly smart oh, but you watch something like bay uh, you know and, <laughs> and a professional animal trainer with real time and he's got them marching around in groups shoulder to shoulder and following all these complicated directions so if you can do that to sheep i'm pretty sure you can get a dinosaur to poo in the corner a yeah. dog can do that to sheep <laughs> but if you know if you... <laughs> well i say i've got no experience of dinosaurs at all but i did in my series map men where me and mark cooper jones talk all about the world's most exciting and funniest and silliest maps we talk about the map of Pangaea that was first proposed by Alfred Wegener um, back in 1915. He was the first person to discover, or at least come up with the idea of, continental drift. And apparently one of the things that helped him to prove his theory was the fact that he was looking around digging for fossils and found matching fossils that had drifted many, many miles apart. And the example we come up with in the episode is we say that um, they found eff- uh, evidence of the Lystrosaurus in Africa, Antarctica, and India. Um, now, we got in a bit of trouble for this. We said Lystrosaurus was a dinosaur and that's because I like I suppose like a lot of people I thought if it ends in saurus it must be a dinosaur and if it's extinct it must be a dinosaur so my question is I should have asked this before um, first of all sorry and second of all what was a Lystrosaurus so yeah Lyst- Lystrosaurs are very cool animals and they're one of these you're absolutely spot on that they were a Lystrosaurus was a critical argument for continental trip it and a handful of other fossils were things that were yeah turning up on these odd bits of continent continents that only make sense when you put continents back together like east coast of south america and west coast of africa um suddenly that works when you plug them back together you know it's like how could they get to africa but they couldn't get to brazil from argentina that sounds ludicrous well it makes more sense when you realize that those two things were next to each other also the Um, fact that even from far away they just look like they match it's like the most obvious and most enticing piece of the jigsaw yeah particularly those two it does look like but they just they just go together like like that But yeah, Lystrosaurus was a squat little pig-like animal it's been described as because it was probably rooting around and eating tubers and tough plants. And if it came across an insect or an early mammal or frog, it would have probably chowed down on that as well. Um, Kind of squat body, squat legs, like a perhaps oversized corgi with a relatively fat tail. Scaly, possibly with some filaments and maybe even early fur things because they're actually on the mammal side of the branch and not on the reptile side of the branch. So they are, they're not ancestors of, but they are very early relatives of mammals. Um, From a time when reptiles and what would go on to become mammals were really quite similar to each other, which is why they were fundamentally scaly and would have looked reptile-like and why they have Saurus as their as their name suffix. Um, but Lystrosaurus like dominated the planet. There's this period in the Permian, this is the period before the Mesozoic where the dinosaurs live, 
lived. And the Permian was just like, yeah, it's just Lystrosaurus. It's just Lystrosaurus, 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 Lystrosaurus. This thing was absolutely everywhere and in colossal numbers. I remember a friend of mine telling me years ago, uh, he was out in the Karoo Basin in South Africa, where they're really famous from. And he'd been asked to pick up a couple of skulls for his museum. And he was out there doing something else. He went, oh, okay, I'm told they're quite common. And he said, you know, he's got out the car in a good spot, walked around, said after five minutes, he found this really nice Lystrosaurus skull. So carefully wrapped it up, shoved it in his bag. And five minutes later, he found another one. Five minutes later, he found another one. He said after about an hour, he found like eight. <laughs> so he had wow. to, like, to sort through them to decide which were the two or three best ones to take back. So they're just that common. You know, tens of millions of years before the dinosaurs existed. I really wish I'd known that when we made our video. We actually, we came from a place of such ignorance that not only did we call the Lystrosaurus a dinosaur, <laughs> we actually, on the day when we were filming, we mispronounced it and we said Lytosaurus. And if you watch the video very carefully, you can see it's been dubbed. The <laughs> one time when, when Mark looks at the camera and says the word Lystrosaurus on camera, watch his mouth very carefully. He didn't say it. He said Lytosaurus and we had to do a bit of magic ADR. Excellent. Oh, I didn't spot that. Wow. Thank you for putting us right. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, so so sm small addendum to that. So my PhD supervisor, a guy called Mike Benton, years ago was like the consultant on a BBC Big Horizon documentary on Lystrosaurus and in particular the, the Permian extinction. So at the end of the Permian and leading into the Mesozoic, we have the greatest mass extinction of all time. And this is an area Mike's an expert in. Um, and they wanted to make a special show about this. And they were using Lystrosaurus as like this keystone animal because it actually survives. It, it gets over the boundary. It's so numerous and perhaps planet wide that it was able to find some pockets to, to cling on and, and makes it into the Mesozoic. Um, and Mike had to kind of describe this animal at the fairly last minute because obviously they hadn't bothered to speak to him until they'd recorded and videoed everything. <laughs> <laughs> and described it as largely as I did it's like it kind of pig like um, if you want an idea of its kind of squat body shape and size and general behaviour and then Mike was horrified to discover and you can find this it is still available or at least you, I've, I've seen the clip and Horizon title When Pigs Ruled the Earth <laughs> that's what they called the show about wow. the Permian and he's just like oh no that's not what I said no it's that's not, not but... what I Man. You've just given me oh, an amazing idea for a film franchise that might just do better than Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, that well you want you want to see Razorback in that case. So Australian horror film from about 1985 about a giant pig eating people in the Australian outback. Uh, the model for which was then recycled for Jurassic Park to make a walking triceratops that never made it into the film. Have you seen a film from about ten years ago called a film from about ten years ago called The Happening, where the trees get angry and get revenge on mankind? I am aware of it. I haven't watched it. <laughs> It's supposed to be quite awful, isn't it? It's awfully amazing. I'll say nothing more. Go, go watch The Happening. <laughs> I shall enjoy it. Amazing. Well, Jay, have we answered all of your various dinosaur questions? Are you pleased? And Lystrosaurus questions. <laughs> You've answered all five and a half of them, and I'm going to go away very satisfied. <laughs> Thank you so Wonderful. much for Thank doing this. Thank you so this. much. Yeah. It's really great. Thank you for having me. What's it's dinosaur really for? Fun. Thank you. Rawr. Rawr. <laughs> 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 that that was really quite simultaneous and therefore slightly <laughs> creepy that we did that a massive thank you to Jay Foreman there please do go to jayforeman.co.uk and check out his YouTube which is amazing there's all the episodes of Map Men and uh, I'm going to say that again Map Men because the puh I said Map Men and it makes him sound like he was made of maps no maps like the, how you get around uh, unlike me I don't get around this conversation at all I'm mucking it up but yes jayforeman.co.uk do check him out. Well, uh, other than that, then, Dave, um, we need to do a little episode on that tiny little um, household pet um, ceratopsian, I think. Aquilops. Yeah, I think we do, because we need an entire episode on what to feed it and what sort of bed it would like. Do you think it would like a dog bed or a cat bed? Do you think it, you're looking really <laughs> unimpressed? I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking very unimpressed because the number of different beds we bought for our rabbit, which the rabbit roundly rejected each and every one one of them, despite other people's rabbits really liking them, uh, means that individual variation and narky animals means it's largely irrelevant what you think. <laughs> where where did your rabbit end up sleeping? Oh, he did have a bed, but we always tried to get him different beds and he just wouldn't okay. sleep in them. Okay, it just liked the bed it had, but it wasn't like a sort of like weird it didn't sleep in a bucket or something. No. Okay, it had a bed. Yeah. What sort of bed did you get a rabbit? Well, no, like cushion. Okay, <laughs> like it cushion. had a cushion. There you go. It's not that unreasonable a question. Where does your rabbit sleep? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
If you've got a question like where does your rabbit sleep, please email <laughs> please <laughs> terriblelizardspod <email>. <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> Uh, but until next week, um, uh, do you think they would have roared or would have they squawked? Because they got beaks like parrots. Aquilops <laughs> squeak. I mean, it's just not big enough to give up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but what would Taurosaurus do, though? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do I look like? Some kind of expert in dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, now I've got the beard, I do really look like you, you the have grown a beard. So. Annoyingly stereotypical pain. It's kind of like he's kind of looks a bit like Captain Haddock. Anyway, <laughs> after three, we'll say goodbye. Three, two, one. Rah! This episode of Terrible Lizards was made possible by our generous patrons on Patreon. To support the show and for bonus content, please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards. For links to everything, including merch and past episodes, go to terrible lizards.co.uk please follow us both on twitter i'm at isdi underscore l-a-w-r-e-n-c-e and dave is at d-a-v-e underscore h-o-n-e send us your questions either via patreon or terrible lizards pod at gmail.com if you can't afford to support us on patreon please do write a review and recommend the show to your friends thank you so much for your support it means a lot to us 